We would like to thank Mike and um, Russo's Catering and the Graphic Arts for being able to uh, postpone and reschedule our event for us. Uh, they've been wonderful, helpful, and have worked around um, us rescheduling. So thank you to them. Um, my name is Karen Nickel. I will be your MC today. I will be introducing our speakers and helping us to follow our agenda, stay focused, and on time. When you registered, you should have received a program, um, a packet with some important information. In your packet, you'll find a half sheet of paper with information on how to become a member of Just Moms, an odor survey about Bridgeton landfill experiences, the Coldwater Creek Health Survey, a petition asking Bill Gates to help stop polluting our community, and a blank piece of paper for you to take notes and write down important information. We are going to open our meeting with a prayer led by Gail Thackeray with the Franciscan Sisters of Mary. Gail is the justice coordinator for the Franciscan Sisters and does a fabulous job working with this community and all involved in our fight to be safe and protected. I would also like to mention how thankful we are to have the Franciscan Sisters and the other Sisters of uh, Faith pledging their full support towards the cleanup of the Westlake landfill issues. The Sisters hold prayer vigils, reach out to other faiths, write letters to elected officials, and attend our monthly community meetings. Gail. Thank you. It's so good to be here. As we always do, just take a moment to be in presence of your spirit of divine. And we'll begin in a moment. God of life, God of compassion and overflowing love, we come together in your powerful presence and thank you for the grace you pour out on us every moment of every day. You hold all of your creation, stars, planets, mountains and rivers, trees, crickets, even one of us, each one of us in existence by your love. Bless all who gather here today Open our hearts and minds that we may learn well from one another. We thank you for the kindness we experience from one another, the support and the encouragement. We thank you that we can look back over the past many months and see what we have accomplished working together. Especially today, we ask your blessing on your beloved daughter, Lois Gibbs, who comes to share her experience, wisdom and insights with our communities. We thank you once again for the persistence and the commitment of those who have long been in this struggle for the well-being of all in the St. Louis, St. Charles area. We pray your powerful guidance on our political leaders that they be courageous in our names and for the good of generations to come. We pray that Republic Services be relieved of any further decision making concerning the radioactive waste at West Lake and that, go excuse me, and that governance of the radioactive waste be officially turned over to the St. Louis Army Corps of Engineers. We pray that a final remedy to the radioactivity at Westlake comes soon. And we pray that the voices of those seeking just buyouts are finally heard. In all of this, we confidently raise our hearts to you once again and hope that your life-giving spirit will find us ready to learn what, we, what will help us to be more effective stewards of our regional home and good neighbors to one another. This is our prayer. Amen. Next is Dr. Gwendolyn Verhoff. Gwendolyn grew up in North St. Louis County and completed her PhD in history at Washington University in St. Louis. She has served as a lecturer in history at Washington University and is currently an assist assistant professor at St. Louis Community College, Wildwood. Wendy will also have the honor, honor of introducing Mrs. Kay Dry, founding member of the Missouri Coalition for the Environment in 1969 and civil rights and anti-nuclear activist. Wendy? Oh. <laughs> 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 
Thank you, everyone. I'm very honored to be here. Um, for me, the story of these sites and of our experience with radiation and radioactive waste began when I was just a very small child, and it began as the story of a place. So our family would take weekly drives around the airport here in St. Louis, um, and as a matter of course, my brother would roll down the window every time we approached the former storage area where Mallinckrodt stored most of its wet residues from downtown production and lay back in his seat and declare to all of us that he had been thoriated. And then we would drive on and weekly, and we would repeat this. And so some of my earliest memories as a child are memories of radioactive waste. We knew, even as children, that there was something very noteworthy about being connected to this place that was connected also to atomic bombs. We had thorium in our neighborhood, and we knew that most other people probably didn't. Now, much later, um, it occurred to me that the question of how it came to be that so many remnants of nuclear production um, were present in heavily populated suburban residential areas, that was a question of the most compelling kind. And so I looked further into that in the course of doing my doctoral research. A lot of us, when we hear the words atomic and nuclear, um, we think of the period bordering around World War II. Um, we think of the nuclear bombs that ended World War II in 1945. But really understanding the history of this, this event and of our own area requires looking back just a little bit further. Um, as early as 1895, with the discovery of x-rays, scientists all over the world were enticed by this, this existence of a universe of invisible forces that they were just learning um, that it existed. Um, they came to understand over the first decades of the 20th century that the atom was made of discrete pieces and that all of those pieces were held together by energetic forces and that you could actually view those sometimes very visibly. Um, as early as 1903, visitors to the New York Museum of Natural History could view samples of radium that had been put there for guests to look at. And they were so energetic that they glowed on their own. And observers looked at that radium in the cases, and they saw what they believed to be the essence of life, perhaps the power within the sun, and all of that promised to transform the way that people lived. Observers believed that somewhere in that secret force, there was a power perhaps to transform the squalor of contemporary cities that were blackened by coal dust and perhaps give people better lives overall. It was before World War I, as early as 1913, that authors began writing for the first time about the destructive potential of that force to end the world in a war with nuclear weapons. The futurist H.G. Wells wrote one of those very first stories. A succession of World's Fairs encapsulated this idea. And here you can see a very gleaming white structure. This is Festival Hall from the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904. In the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904, scientists from all over the world came to exchange information about this new phenomenon of radioactivity. So our experience with the nuclear story goes back all the way to 1904. Many visitors to the World's Fair of 1904 shared this faith in progress, and they saw electricity for the first time. This is Festival Hall. It was illuminated at night. Edward Mallinckrodt, Jr., who was at the helm of America's nuclear production effort as it revolved around uranium in St. Louis during World War II, graduated from college in 1901. He was a member of this World's Fair generation. As a youth, he recalled playing with a colleague um, who was also a young man, um, between eight years old and a teenager, and the two took to calling themselves the electricians. One of my favorite pictures of Edward Mallinckrodt is this one. It was taken in the 1880s, and you can see here a small child, and he's in his father's chemistry lab. His father had founded the Mallinckrodt Chemical Works, and Edward Mallinckrodt liked to go into the laboratory and play amongst the apparatus and think about experiments. Now this looks like someone has taken a picture of Mallinckrodt, again amidst this favorite place that he liked to be, but this is actually one of his very early experiments, and he's taking his own picture. He's figured out a way to take a self-portrait of himself as the scientist. And so this is a gentleman who was predisposed from the earliest possible age to be excited about this new field of endeavor as it emerged during the Second World War. 
even as late as his 50th college reunion at Harvard, as he prepared remarks to share with his class, he prepared those containing the words of a former mentor that had meant a lot to him throughout his life. Fear not to go where fearless science leads, who holds the keys of God. After 1945, when the media revealed the contribution of the Mallinckrodt Chemical Works to the nuclear effort, there was nothing in that coverage that necessarily would cause the public locally to reject its role in the manufacture of atomic weapons. Um, the mystique of science, um, aspiration, and what had been accomplished was what was emphasized. Local stories did mirror a national conversation that was very ambivalent about nuclear technology and what it would mean. Um, this is a trailer for a film that was released very early in this period in 1946. It is appropriately titled The Beginning or The End. And you'll notice the couple on the left um, very much filled with a sense of doom after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The couple on the right, by turns, um, curious, reflective, perhaps even cautiously hopeful that something good could come out of all of these experiences of war that were so negative. In 1945, Newsweek ran stories about the potential of nuclear technology, again, placing St. Louis at the forefront of a development that could be hopeful for the whole nation if we were to read those stories from our own locale. Every American, at some point in the future, would have an atomic-powered car. The public in the future would fly in atomic-powered airplanes. So you can see the atom featured prominently in the graphic of the aircraft. Uh, this is my favorite image from this period. This appeared in 1947 in Collier's Magazine. And I think it shows more than any other um, the hope that the atom and the energy, again, that it contained could help people overcome even the most tragic of circumstances. Unfortunately, as realities all around us show, some of this golden age that was hoped for um, has not materialized. And our realities, our nuclear realities, have been something of a different kind. As a result of the stockpiling of waste in North St. Louis County, contaminated soil is still being removed from all of the places that you see, bounded in red here. These are the North County sites and vicinity properties. And here at the bottom of the drawing is the original airport site around which my family used to drive when we were children, right here. In the vicinity of Weldon Spring, a gleaming white structure of still a different type, a permanent waste disposal cell, now sits as the highest point in St. Charles County, rising roughly 75 feet. The bulk of the cleanup at Weldon Spring stretched between 1988 and 2001. You can see some of that cleanup still in progress here. Ultimately, the cell contained when it was finished roughly one and a half million cubic yards of contaminated debris and waste material that had been left scattered in the locale of the plant. It was gathered into the cell, which is expected to maintain its integrity for a thousand years. Today, as it stands, again, rather bright in the sun, very, very white, it covers fully 45 acres. Still another part of the story, the workers who refine the uranium, they are also very much a part of what nuclear production has meant to our community. Mallinckrodt workers receive very significant exposures to radiation in the course of carrying out their work, and in many cases, severe resultant harm to their health. In the year 2000, the Energy Employees Occupational Illness and Compensation Program Act was passed to compensate workers like the ones from Mallinckrodt. And our St. Louis workers were the first workers to pass what became known as special exposure cohorts to negotiate the process of getting compensation without going through the lengthy dose reconstruction process that the law requires of most applicants. If you establish an SEC, that special exposure cohort, much of the paperwork um, can be gotten through in a much, much more expeditious fashion. As a result of petitions, from St. Louis workers, which became um, exemplary for later applicants. Um, that process has been made easier for nuclear workers all over the United States. There is no one in St. Louis, and perhaps even the United States as a whole country, who has devoted more time or energy to the ramifications of nuclear technology than Kay Dry. Um, Kay has a long and distinguished career as a humanitarian, a philanthropist, and an activist for environmental quality. During the 1960s, she fought for fair housing in integrated neighborhoods in University City. She helped achieve the relocation of the St. Louis Symphony to its current home in Powell Hall. She supported efforts by her husband, Leo Dry, 
to build sustain and sustainably manage a 146,000 acre forest, today known as the Pioneer Forest in rural Missouri. She's a founder of the Green Center in University City and sits on the boards of the Great Rivers Environmental Law Center and Beyond Nuclear. Kay began her career as a public advocate on nuclear issues on November the 13th, 1974, with a speech before the Missouri Senate. That same year, the Atomic Energy Commission commissioned an early review of waste that had been illegally dumped in the Westlake landfill and found that waste to be problematic. That same year, 1974, the Atomic Energy Commission itself dissolved permanently, splitting into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the entity that would become the U.S. Department of Energy. And that very day that Kay made her first speech on nuclear issues, nuclear activist Karen Silkwood died in an auto accident. Two years later in 1976, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported for the first time on the illegal disposal of waste at the Westlake landfill. That year, Kay helped organize the Coalition of Citizens for Reformed Electric Rates. The goal of this organization was to provide um, an opposition to an effort by Union Electric Company to fund the construction of Callaway Nuclear Plant by charging its, its uh, customers ahead of time for that project. So the petition drive resulted in a pro proposition, proposition number one, on the ballot, which on November 2nd, 1976, um, passed by 62% preventing Union Electric from funding its nuclear development in that particular way. Throughout the 1980s, Kay fought to secure the removal of radioactive wastes from North St. Louis County, and she helped to prevent the construction of a permanent waste cell near the airport in St. Louis County, like the one that we were just viewing, that now is located in St. Charles County near Weldon Spring. She remains committed to seeing that radioactive wastes and their potential consequences receive proper attention wherever or whenever they might have been generated. And so it's my sincere honor to introduce Kay Dry. Thank you. Hi. Sometimes I cry when I speak. I'll try not to. That was very nice. Where's my little friend? <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Everyone here today knows about uphill battles. In fact, perhaps some of us even enjoy them on occasion. Lois Gibbs is a person who attacked her contaminated canal and community with knowledge, hard work, and good judgment, and she was successful. She then converted the Love Canal victory into a national, I'm, I'm having trouble because it's so messy, okay, into a national citizen guidance, national citizen guidance project. Um, along with her toxicologist husband, Steve, and their coworkers at the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, they have provided advice and courage to communities all over the place, like to us here in St. Louis. We're grateful to Lois Gibbs. It is simply not possible to conceive of a worse location in which to leave highly radioactive waste than in the floodplain of the flood-prone Missouri River. In the center of the United States, upstream from drinking water intakes, and with the, within the airshed of one of our nation's major population centers. Here's some of the history of these wastes. Starting in April 1942, during World War II, the Mallinckrodt Chemical Works on North Broadway, a mile from downtown St. Louis, was contracted by the Army Corps of Engineers Manhattan Project in total secrecy to try to figure out how to purify the tons of uranium needed to make atom bonds. Mallinckrodt was successful in only 50 days. And on December 2nd, 1942, exactly 70 years ago, the world's first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction occurred in Chicago using uranium purified by Mallinckrodt. 
but the brilliant scientists and engineers who carried us into the atomic age were never asked if they could get us out. Mellencrop processed uranium and thorium and generated radioactive waste for 25 years, for 15 years downtown and then for 10 years at Weldon Spring in St. Charles County. A 42-acre, seven-story bunker at Weldon Spring holds the St. Charles waste. Contractors for the Army Corps of Engineers, starting in around 1997, and for the U.S. Department of Energy before then, have already dug up more than 1,088,000 cubic yards of waste in St. Louis City and County that they have shipped away from St. Louis to a federally licensed facility in Utah or to a state permitted facility in Idaho at a cost to the federal government of $795 million so far. Some of the nuclear weapons radioactive waste generated downtown at Mallinckrodt were dumped at a 22-acre site next to the St. Louis airport. Some of those wastes were then trucked to a site nearby in Hazelwood to be dried out in kilns to make them weigh less for cheaper shipping. They were sent by train out to the Cotter Mining Corporation in Colorado to be reprocessed. But when the Atomic Energy Commission discovered that the workers were not being given either information or protective clothing at, at Laddie Avenue for handling those dangerous, highly dangerous wastes, the drying and shipping site was suddenly abandoned, leaving behind huge amounts of radioactive materials. And those are the identical, highly radioactive materials that were then secretly dumped in 1973 at the Westlake Municipal Waste Landfill in the Missouri River floodplain next to Earth City in Bridgeton. Neither the federal nor the St. Louis County government was notified of the dumping at Westlake. And the public was not notified either until a 1976 article by Margaret Freivogel appeared in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I have that article with me this evening, this afternoon. Westlake Landfill, the focus of our concerns today, is located in Bridgeton in the floodplain of the Missouri, of the flood-prone Missouri River. It is, lies just eight river miles upstream from the drinking water intake for North St. Louis County. The landfill is also upstream from the Missouri-Mississippi River confluence near the main St. Louis City water intake and treatment plant. The Westlake wastes also pose a risk to our St. Louis air, as you well know, that is, to the air we breathe. The uranium and thorium residues that were illegally dumped at Westlake in 1973 will remain highly radioactive longer than all of recorded history. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency mandates that Superfund sites like Westlake be monitored every five years. At Westlake, such monitoring would have to continue virtually forever into the future. What if extreme weather or a terrorist attack were suddenly to disperse the Westlake waste? Or, as we are suddenly having to consider, what if a landfill fire were to reach these historic, long-lived radioactive waste? An unknown but significant amount of the uranium residues at Westlake came originally from the Belgian Congo and resulted from the processing of uranium for the manufacture of the earliest atom bombs and subsequent ones. I sometimes boast or protest that St. Louis contains the oldest radioactive waste of the atomic age. In 1993, the St. Louis region experienced major flooding. The Monarch Levee on the Mississippi, I'm sorry, on the Missouri River at Chesterfield was breached resulting in the inundation of Chesterfield Valley. The levee was subsequently enlarged to protect the now heavily developed valley from future floods. Therefore, the huge volume of river water now channeled past the redesigned Monarch Levee could go, that water, that huge volume of water could go over, through, or under the Earth City Levee, just downstream from the Monarch Levee potentially causing the dispersal of the Westlake landfill's radioactive wastes. Already during the Great Flood of 1993, people had to be stationed on top of the Earth City levee 
to monitor the rising river, which nearly topped the levee. And just please remember, it's the Earth City levee that's supposedly protecting the waste that's dumped at Westlake. And the Riverport levee across Interstate 70 experienced sand boils for which truckloads of rock had to be imported. This is a maze. This is um, my friend Carolyn Bauer, who was one of the three authors of the incredible series of, in the Post-Dispatch that alerted the entire metropolitan St. Louis and beyond to these problems. No one would have known about it without that series that ran for eight days in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. What year was it, Carolyn? Where are you? What year was it? 1989? Is that right? And Carolyn still gives a darn, which is nice. Now, let's see. This is She figured out what I was supposed to read from all these hundreds of years of speeches. Okay, now let's see. Carolyn, now where am I supposed to go? Okay, let's see. Okay, to quote from the late Stuart Udall, a superb U.S. Secretary of the Interior in the 1960s, quotes, Atomic weapons facilities have created massive pollution problems in many areas of the United States. After years of study, experts still don't know exactly how to handle the mess. Because the United States has chosen to produce nuclear weapons, the U.S. taxpayers have the fiscal and moral responsibility to clean up those weapons wastes that otherwise will continue to pollute our air and water virtually forever. I don't want to rely on Re Republic to clean it up. Uh, and really, this, the federal government is cleaning up the nuclear weapons waste all over the United States, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, St. Louis District, knows how to do it. And I hope you all will, I think, is that the end, Carolyn? I guess that's the end, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I hope you all will pick up copies of a petition that, is, that was printed at a union printer yesterday, uh, Peace Institute Printing. And um, we have petition seeking the removal of radioactive waste from Westlake Landfill in Missouri. One of the petitions is written to the Board of Aldermen of the City of St. Louis, and that petition is to be signed by residents of St. Louis. And they have to be uh, registered voters. The, the petition person signed, uh, handing these petitions out or getting these signed can be a resident of the city or county, um, has to be registered. Are you raising your hand? No, you're just stretching. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the, the petition says to the board, one petition is for the city of St. Louis, and one is for for the county, and if enough people sign these petitions, am I going to be, am I talking too long? Huh? You're getting in trouble. I'm, getting, I'm talking too long, you goofball. Okay. Here's what it says, and then I'll quit. We, the undersigned registered voters of the city of St. Louis or registered voters of St. Louis County, urge the St. Louis Board of Aldermen or the St. Louis County Council to adopt a resolution demanding that the appropriate federal authorities Remove all radioactive waste from Westlake Landfill, which is located in the Missouri River floodplain, above drinking water intakes for St. Louis City and St. Louis County. Thank you all. Thank you, Kay. Okay. Next up is a guy that has been working extremely hard on the Westlake landfill issue since March 2013. Representative Bill Otto for the 70th District is here today. Bill has been assisted by one of his on, uh, key people, Harvey Herd Ferdman. And through Representative Otto's office, there has been ongoing open lines of communication with the EPA, our Missouri Attorney General, Missouri Department of Natural Resources, Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, County Health, 
as well as Senator McCaskill's and Senator Blunt and Representative Wagner and Clay's offices. Representative Otto attends almost every community meeting and has done a great job keeping this community and working closely with the moms up on the information. So I would like to introduce to you State Representative Mr. Bill Otto. Thank you so much for that. And I get to follow Kay. I've been in this hall many times. They've, uh, the printers have always been so gracious to the community to open this hall up. Um, and to have a room this full, uh, I've never, never seen it this full, never at all. And you all should be proud of yourself, absolutely. I really only have one job here this morning, uh, and I get to introduce somebody. Uh, I was asked to introduce, introduce uh, one of the moms. But really, the, to introduce this person, to introduce Dawn Chapman, doesn't go far enough. And I know Dawn would know that. She simply represents the many, many voices and the many faces involved in this, in this dilemma. She really does. Could you imagine being at home, raising your family, doing the things that you do, trying to be part of the community, and then all of a sudden have this thrust upon you. A lot of these folks didn't know this radioactive waste was there. Uh, uh, Ferd Fetch is not here today, but Ferd and I represented that area many, many years ago in the early 90s. And we knew it was there, but it didn't have the fire. It didn't have the sense of urgency that it has now. But Dawn represents simply more than just, than just her and her family. Um, there, are, there are several of folks here, a lot of the moms, and, and I, I find the name itself fascinating, just, just the moms. Um, I know, I know um, they all have different levels of families, different involvement in the communities. One of them has a 29-year-old daughter, I believe, and a 9-year-old daughter, or son, and Karen, we have found a cure for that, by the way, <laughs> and grandchildren on top. Um, and I try to remind Dawn all the time of the political, uh, the political ramifications of what, of what she does and what, and what the group represents. Uh, when, when the press wants to talk to somebody, they don't call me, they call Dawn. They call somebody in the group. Um, they, are the, they are the face and the voice for all of this group. And out of one voice comes many. And they're pursued by the media, and they're pursued now by politicians. And you can especially tell that in a primary when one of, the, one of the first, one of the main points in several of the campaigns was remediation of the, of the radioactive waste. Uh, radioactive waste. <laughs> and you can tell the level of commitment from these folks by the, the number of meetings that they, that they attend, whether they send representatives, whether they get to the details of what's involved, because this is very, a very, very, uh, difficult subject, very, very complicated, and it's hard to know, but you have to have people that are willing to stand by and to learn. And I want to caution you, I want to caution you to end this group, that you're going to be pursued by folks that will show up at the last meeting before an election. You'll be pursued by folks who want your endorsement, who want to be involved, and yet they've not been to the meetings, they've not, they've not done the investigation. And I will tell you right now, I do not have the, the ability to under, understand all of this. So I have to turn, my job isn't to, isn't to lead this group, my job is to represent these folks and to make sure that they have the voice that they deserve. The one thing you have to do though, you have to follow the money. You have to follow money and support. When, when somebody shows up and they say, I want to be your friend, I want to support you, make sure you find out where their donations are coming from. Make sure that they are not always supported only by people who are involved in this coalition that's trying to turn the entire state of Missouri against this landfill, against the folks that are trying to do best for their community. Be careful with that. Those are the people that may come to us today and say, we're on your side. But when the vote on the floor comes due, they're going to pay homage to Republic Services. I, 
I have to tell you that that my involvement with this group has has really been yeah, I mean it's inspirational without a doubt understand that when somebody stands up for their for themselves and their family they're protecting the community and doing what they can at the time when they stand up for their children they're acknowledging the future and what needs to be done now but when they stand up for their grandchildren and their grandparents they know they're saying that we can change not only today and tomorrow but we can make a better world for us for st louis and the entire community and it is my pleasure and absolute honor to to introduce to you right now don chapman Actually, you get to hear from me again. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not going to tell you about science. I'm not going to tell you about studies. I'm going to tell you a story. And I want you to picture this in your minds. And this is going to be really hard. <sighs> Imagine living on a street full of young families with lots of children a park at the end of the street on the banks of a creek where kids spent hours day after day catching minnows, crawdads, and playing on tire swings. A close-knit neighborhood with block parties and hide-and-seek, riding bikes through water puddles, digging in dirt, making mud pies, snow sledding, and swimming in a pool in your backyard. Of course, the creek was always an attraction for most kids in the neighborhood, but oftentimes very frustrating for parents as it would flood into the park and homes and eventually onto the streets. People would be waiting and kids would, be kids would end up playing in the floodwaters. There were a couple times it flooded so bad there were even boats in the neighborhood. Oftentimes we couldn't cross over the bridge to get to elementary school because the water was so high from the creek. And yes, my grade school was on the banks of Coldwater Creek as well. Then imagine the creek being contaminated with radioactive waste, such as thorium, uranium, and radium, from leftover nuclear weapons waste made from the making of the atomic bomb. Imagine what that would look like after the waters of that creek, known as Coldwater Creek, receded back within its banks. The dried dusts and contamination it would leave on the streets and yards. Imagine the backyard gardens that were flooded from creek water. But you see, the creek wasn't the only thing contaminating. This same waste that was washing into Coldwater Creek also had sat out in huge piles on Laddie Avenue in Hazelwood, uncovered for years, blowing tiny, tiny particles all over North County. Much of this waste also blew over uh, Berkeley Quarry League, where many children played ball, and me again, one of them. Keep in mind, all of this was happening, and my parents, as well as many others, didn't know anything about it. What I just described was my childhood neighborhood in Hazelwood in North County. Fast forward 40 years later. Same little girl, now all grown up with four children of her own and two grandchildren, living in a similar type neighborhood several miles from Hazelwood in Maryland Heights. When I heard the radioactive waste contamination in North County, it was July 2012. I remember thinking one good thing, I no longer live in that area, but I wanted to find out more. I learned of the Coldwater Creek Just the Facts Facebook page, and I met Janelle Wright. I read every single post on that page. It prompted me to do my own personal research and reach out to those I grew up with. Through Facebook, I discovered that 15 people just on my childhood street had passed away or were struggling with cancer. Rare cancers. Friends and their parents had died in their mid-40s. I remember thinking back to a time when I was a kid about my friend 
that had lost both of his parents to brain cancers in their late 30s and how devastated the neighborhood was for this family. But what I was finding out wasn't just cancer. It was birth defects, fertility, autoimmune diseases, such as the one I have, systemic lupus. I had never even heard of lupus when I was diagnosed years ago. Had no idea why I would have it. No one in my family had it, but all of a sudden, I learned of four other women within a couple of houses on my street alone diagnosed with the same disease. It was very hard and overwhelming to digest all of this news. I was feeling like everything I did as a child was some kind of lie. My childhood innocence felt like it was being ripped out of my heart. Thinking back about how life was so simple and easy as a kid, making memories and building the foundation of what life would look like for my own children, only to learn 40 years later it was all while being poisoned by the creek and blowing particles of radioactive waste. While attending a meeting about the cleanup efforts of Coldwater Creek in North County, I was approached by Ed Smith of Missouri Coalition for the Environment about a landfill in Bridgeton that contained the same nuclear waste. I learned that the same waste had been transported from Laddie Avenue and illegally dumped at the Westlake landfill back in 1973. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Because you see, Westlake landfill is located 1.8 miles away from the home I currently live in and have been raising my children. The odds of my children getting sick from the same waste that could be responsible for the illnesses and deaths I had just heard about from North County was devastating. Once again, we're back to the issue of not knowing. I didn't know anything of this, and I was pretty sure my friends and family hadn't either. So I created the Westlake Landfill Facebook page. I started attending meetings being held by Missouri Coalition for the Environment. I built a strong relationship with Janelle Wright with Coldwater Creek. I read documents, and I started talking to the local elected officials. In November 2012, we started smelling and hearing about the underground smoldering event fire occurring at the adjacent Bridgeton landfill. Yet another secret in which, this, in which was being kept from this community. I met Dawn Chapman in January of 2013 at an air sampling event and learned she too lived in Maryland Heights, just a couple of blocks from my house. She was learning that she too had been raising her children for several years, less than two miles from a Superfund site. From the day we met, her and I would spend hours on the phone with the Department of Natural Resources, Department of Health and Senior Services, plotting fire information on our own handmade charts because we weren't getting information. We had to go out and dig for this information about this fire, about where this radioactive waste lied in the landfill about the 2008 record of decision. We quickly became very educated and more so than we ever wanted to know about landfills. Shortly thereafter, we met Debbie Disser, and thank goodness for Debbie because Debbie has the gift of researching. Debbie has brought so much to this group and we couldn't do what we do without her. I can remember thinking, wow, when we had 100 people on the Facebook page. Now we have over 3,400 people on the page. We have a website, and we also have learned how to Twitter, which for me, that's pretty good because I'm old. <laughs> we, have been, we have come to be known as the moms, but it's just not us three. It's Megan Beckerman over here. It's Terry. Bob Terry right here. It's moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles. It's you guys. Our children can't play outside at times. Our friends at Spanish Village and the mobile home park can't open their windows because of the stench. Our children have breathing problems, bloody noses, and rashes. We are being emotionally, socially, and mentally abused. I know every single person in this room would do anything to keep their children healthy and safe. And I think that's one thing that we can all definitely agree on.
We have many examples of, way you, of ways you can help. That half sheet of paper that I spoke about earlier. If you want to become a member of Just Moms STL, we would appreciate it. You can fill out that form and tell us what you can do. Write one thing that you can do on that paper to volunteer to help. Well, we spent all morning crying. I'm going to tell you that. I'm done crying today. I'm pissed off right now, so get ready. Um, I want to introduce again Debbie Disser, Karen, Megan. It's not just myself. They're Janelle Wright, Angie Hibling, Kim Thone, who drove in from Michigan. These, Byron Clemens, Doug Clemens, Ch Ch the list goes on and on and on of people that have become involved in this. I'm going to tell you right now, when I came, we came from the sisters this morning, and we all had a good cry. It was very emotional. That whole room of Franciscan sisters prays for us. But right now, I want you to know they're praying right now for you. Right now, for the workers in this room, for the Teamsters, from the people out of town. They're praying at this very moment for you because they understand this issue and how scary this is, but they also understand that this is real. When I walked in and I saw... Those people out front handing out those flyers, I was so angry because I know, Bob Terry, I know about your, your grandson. We follow that story. All these people that are ill, these people are real to us. This is happening and we follow them on the page. We pray for them and you know what? Then I thought, it's a good thing that they're out front, isn't it? Because this company's scared and they freaking should be because <laughs> I'm going to steal from Robin from our last meeting. I'll tell you what, when you have, when you have women like Kay Dry and Dr. Vierhoff who've studied this their entire life and have dedicated their lives to this, when you have them joining forces with the local unions and the workforce, the Teamsters across the country, if you're a company and you're faced with that opposition, you're in big trouble. And if they think this... This waste, I know Byron, I know your father worked right across the street from Laddie Avenue. Doug, you said you knew about this when you were a little child, thanks to Kay Dry. These people, this has affected generations, and it will continue to affect generations until it's taken care of. And I want you to understand something, like Karen said, we had to dig for this information, guys. We had to dig. We hand plotted temperature. Our even own fire department didn't have the fire data that it needed. In the beginning, we didn't have it. We have some of it now. I doubt they're being completely forthcoming with it. Let's just put it that way. Because they're fighting and they're put digging their heels in too. But a lot of people have asked. They've said, you know, if this were such a serious issue, then why you know, why isn't it being taken care of? Why isn't it being dug up right now? Surely if it were this serious, the EPA would come in and save the day. Lois is here to tell you that's not going to happen unless every one of you gets up out of your chair and decides to write a letter and make a phone call. These people... I, I, Karen Nickel has lupus. And there are days when she aches so bad she can't even let her family members hug her people. And yet she pulls herself up to get to these meetings because she understands that this is real. This is a generational curse. And you're going to hear that later from the wonderful ladies at Coldwater Creek. You're going to understand the legacy that was left behind. We started it right here in St. Louis. It was started right here. And by God, it's going to end here. Okay? We're going to end the legacy. We're going to put this waste somewhere away from water, away from people, away from fire. We're going to close that chapter. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for coming. hope I don't get emotional, too. Um, my name is Debbie, as you've heard. Um, I also grew up near Coldwater Creek. I did not live on it, but I grew up in Bromley Subdivision, 1.4 miles away from the airport site. I also played on the quarry field, which is just 0.2 miles north of the airport site and about 0.4 miles from the Laddie site. The dust from this 
these two sites blew over the quarry field. You could see it blowing. And, you know, you just didn't know what you were playing in. <coughs> Earlier this year, I was diagnosed, diagnosed with hypothyroidism. And I don't know if it's where I lived and played at that was a factor or where I work at now, which is down in the Riverport complex. I and my family also never knew, will know, if growing up next to Cold War Creek or if working just 2.4 miles from the Westlake landfill played a factor in my brother Doug's life. Imagine you are 41 years old and you learn on April 1st, 2007 at 1 a.m. that you don't have the worst case of the flu causing your headaches and pain and nausea, but to learn that you have a mass in your brain. Then what happened to Doug that's what happened to Doug. Imagine having to leave your brother in the emergency room finally after being given something for the pain, to let him finally rest, and going home to get what sleep you can before morning arrives to get up and go tell your parents the news. To learn after surgery the next day that Doug has a tumor the size of a baseball. That tumor was glioblastoma multiform stage four, and he was given 18 months to live. The knowledge of what Doug went through with the chemo and radiation, realizing that he had next to no odds of surviving, and that only 17 days after he turned 43, he lost his battle. When I learned of Coldwater Creek and then Westlake, I turned, with, turned to what I am best at, which is research, and to learning all I could to help to inform others to do what, they could, what, what could be done to get these contaminated sites cleaned up so others would not have to wonder if they will be affected or their families will be affected by this contamination. Although I do not have children, children, I have a niece I love dearly as, long as, as well as her husband and their two children. I wonder daily what effect Coldwater Creek might have had on them or what living eight miles east of Westlake Landfill will have on them in the future. This is why I volunteer my time on Coldwater Creek and Westlake Landfill and why others who volunteer their time to help moms, just moms like Megan and the others that Dawn spoke of, to help inform this community about meetings, to get informed, to find the facts and the truth, so we can teach you how you can read the documents and learn the truth yourself. And some of them documents are very long. Some are 800 pages worth of stuff you have to sift through to find the truth the truth that there's 4,000 tons of herbicides, pesticides, asbestos, fly ash, and that's just the non-nuclear hazardous waste over there. That's on top of what's at Westlake, OU1, Area 1, and Area 2. Thank you. Up here on the right, there's examples of what you can do to help. Up here on the left, our goals, goals that we have set for this community. Buyout, property assurance program, continuous health monitoring. In a little bit, Lois is going to talk to you about what all that means. Next, we're going to hear from Chuck and Kathy Bell. The Bells live at ground zero of the landfill in Spanish Village and su subdivision located just a half mile from the landfill. They will share with you what they have experienced over the past few years and how their lives have been affected. Thank you. I see a lot of neighbors here, so I'm not going to be telling you anything that you don't already know. I grew up in Hazelwood. Is that better? I grew up in Hazelwood, close to Coldwater Creek. Seems to be a theme. Luckily, I did not play in the creek, but my older brother did. He has survived six cancer-related surgeries. In 2008, he underwent what he calls the big one, to remove a golf ball sized tumor at the base of his tongue. He's one of the statistics in the Coldwater Creek Health Survey. Fast forward to 1996. My family moved to Spanish Village. We thought it would be a great place to raise our kids. 
It's a secluded, quiet neighborhood. We did not know that we were moving within a half mile of a landfill with radioactive waste. Living so close to this landfill, we have been exposed to horrible odors, along with the mixture of toxins that are carried in those odors. We can't keep our windows open because of this. A couple of months ago, I had a blonde senior moment and left a window partially open at night because it was nice and cool. And I thought, we'll get some fresh air. Huh. Well, it was nice until about midnight when we woke up with the horrible landfill stench inside our house. That's how potent this stench can be. It woke us from a sound sleep. We're afraid of what our children have been exposed to growing up in Spanish Village, and we worry about the children who live there now. I feel guilty for ever moving my children to Spanish Village. This landfill has caused us headaches, sore throats, burning eyes, and bloody noses. We live in fear. When we go to bed at night, the landfill, or more specifically, what might happen at the landfill, is the last thing on our minds. Will there be another surface fire while we're sleeping? Will the fire reach the radioactive waste and become airborne? Has that already happened? Will there be a large release of benzene or other toxic chemical? Will we need to be evacuated or be told to shelter in place? Whenever I hear multiple sirens close by, my first thought is, did something happen at the landfill? This has taken a physical and emotional toll on us. We live so close to the landfill that if or when something happens there, whatever is released into the air will not have time to dissipate. We'll get a full strength dose. We are asking for a buyout, not just because our quality of life has been taken away from us, not just because we live in fear, we want to buy out because we will not sell our house to another family and put them in this horrible situation. Thank you. And I just want to add, we live so close and that's our major concern and our concern has been with the children of this for so long. That's pretty much how we got involved. You know, our kids grew up in Spanish Village, and our kids aren't sure they even want to have children because this can be passed through generation, and they have a fear of that. And also, I was very involved with my kids growing up playing baseball and softball, coached a softball team of 11 and 12-year-old kids, and my daughter was on that team, as well as uh, another little girl named Kirsty. And she was one of the bravest little girls I've ever known in my life. She played ball for me, and her mother grew up in Spanish Village, and they live in Maryland Heights. And unfortunately, this is a 10 to 12 year old team, she had a massive brain tumor. And like I say, she was probably one of the littlest, bravest girls I've ever met in my life. She continued playing softball through that, and she would get up there, and she would have such shakes that she couldn't control it because of the brain tumor. And I'd have parents say, Chuck, you've got to get up there. That little girl's scared to death. And I would have to explain to them, no, she's not. She has a brain tumor, and she loves to play ball. And a lot of little girls at that age don't want to play. But any time one comes out, Kirsty was the first one up there and said, Coach, put me in. And she did a fantastic job. She would be shaking as that pitch was coming in but she would firm up as soon as that pitch got there, and she would hit that ball, and she would drive it, and she would round those bases, and was one of my best players. Same thing when she is fielding. Just a great, awesome kid. Uh, short and story, you know, we've got to keep it short. She lost her battle to that and died you know, after our 12 year. We won two championships with her. So kind of fast forwarding to this year, we are getting ready, we've gotten a lot of stuff moved from our home because we don't know if we'll have to move in a moment's notice or we'll get some warning. So we won the championship that last year. Kirsty played with us before she died and one of the things I had was the team trophy. 
So trying to decide what will we do with that, I gave it to her mother as she's got a mental Kirsty, and she took that team trophy and it couldn't be at a better place. And she was a fighter and she still fights with us today and that's what I want you all to remember is this isn't over, we need to fight, fight for Kirsty and fight for all the kids like that and our children who are in Spanish Village, the trailer park like that, they shouldn't be exposed to this because you can't tell kids they can't go out and play and enjoy this and it should not happen in this country, it's just pitiful. Thank you again and 